Welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm Justin King. I work in the Asset Building Program here at the New America Foundation. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time to be here today. Um, as you might know, our work in the Asset Building Program is geared towards helping more Americans, particularly low and moderate income Americans, uh, build greater savings, uh, assets, uh, and develop ownership. Uh, along with others in our field, we've put a lot of emphasis on taking ideas to promote savings to scale. And in order to reach scale, obviously, you need systems that touch vast numbers of people. Um, and you can either create those systems uh, or you can piggyback on them. And I don't think it's a mystery uh, which approach is easier. So it's a pleasure to be here just one day after April 15th, tax day, a day that touches the lives of nearly all Americans, and a day that the asset building field has long identified as a key moment uh, for turning the tax filing opportunity uh, for, into an opportunity where all Americans can assess their financial security and use it as an opportunity to build savings and build wealth going forward. Um, our event today is co-sponsored by the Doorways to Dreams Fund. D2D is a nonprofit that does leading, innovative work to promote savings, including savings at tax time. Uh, and it's a pleasure to work with them, and our relationship stretches back many years now. Our event today is called Jackpot, Using Lotteries to Promote Personal Savings. Uh, and our purpose here is to investigate, uh, beyond tax time, another potentially scalable, innovative uh, technique for promoting savings, uh, giving people prizes. First, I, I should say a word about why it's necessary to contemplate uh, ideas like this one. Uh, America's at the bottom end of a 30-year decline uh, in the measurable personal savings rate. Uh, 40 plus percent of Americans don't have enough savings to get by at the poverty line if their family were to lose their income uh, to get by for three months. And 30 percent of Americans simply don't have a savings account. Uh, this matters because savings is incredibly beneficial and important for families. Uh, as our colleague David John of the Heritage Foundation recently said, when families hit a bump in the road, savings is the difference between sleeping in their own bed and sleeping in their car. So in addition to the short term, savings make a huge difference in the long term. Uh, the act of saving itself can change the way that people think about their own future. Uh, it can change their behavior. Uh, which leads to better outcomes, including better educational outcomes for kids and increased economic mobility. Uh, yet many millions of Americans find savings beyond their reach in spite of placing a high value on the goal. A financial planning association survey from some years back famously found that 21 percent of Americans and 38 percent of those with incomes below $25,000 a year uh, believe that winning the lottery was the most practical way to achieve a secure retirement. Uh, but what if they're not entirely wrong? Uh, what if we could use the appeal of gambling, the appeal of the lottery, the raffle, or the sweepstakes to promote saving? Uh, Peter Tofano, the founder of D2D, wrote, in 2003, Americans spent nearly $80 billion on legalized forms of gambling. Perhaps this interest in gaming and prizes could be leveraged to help motivate savings and asset building. Given this potential, prize-linked savings deserve greater study and consideration in the U.S. We hope to begin this process by conducting research to evaluate the introduction of a prize-linked product by private sector financial institutions. The Treasury should also move forward on this front. Uh, that was written in 2006 in a paper called Reinventing the Savings Bond that was published by the New America Foundation. So here we are, seven short years later, uh, and it seems an appropriate time to check in and see what's come of all that research and all of that, uh, uh, all those big promises from years ago. And without spoiling things too much, uh, I, wanna, I wanna say that there has been a tremendous amount of progress. There's been a, a good amount of research. Uh, there's been significant uh, practice uh, that's happened in different states. Uh, and I, if I can say so, I think there's a sense of momentum uh, as more states are examining uh, this approach uh, and, and ways that it can be beneficial to their citizens and to their economies. Um, now, there are barriers. Uh, states take their monopoly on the lottery pretty seriously, uh, and it's incumbent on advocates to show not just the need for promoting savings, but that these are tools that are useful and beneficial. So I'm really thrilled with the panel we have today. Uh, from D2D is our friend Joanna Smith Romani, who will share with us some of the recent research uh, and history of prize link savings. 
From the Heritage Foundation is our friend and colleague Stuart Butler, who has been a strong advocate of savings innovations uh, for many years and will share some of the international perspective on PLS and apply it to our domestic context. Uh, State Representative May Flexer from Connecticut is here, who is a, uh, a leading advocate for a bill that comes up for a vote tomorrow that would allow prize link savings in her great state. Uh, so we are very happy to have all of you here. Uh, we know we have a substantial audience watching online. Uh, if you are a member of our virtual audience, uh, you can participate in the conversation using the hashtag JackpotPLS. Uh, and now let me uh, say I'm very honored to be able to introduce Representative Derek Kilmer from the 6th Dif District of Washington State. Representative Kilmer is a first-term representative in a district that includes Tacoma and all of Olympia Na Olympic National Park. Uh, his career prior, co prior to coming to D.C. was focused squarely on economic development uh, for the people in the communities uh, that he lived in and represented uh, as a state senator. Uh, as a state senator, he continued his work on economic development and became the lead budget writer uh, within the state Senate. He also took the time to investigate the concept of prize link savings, decided that this is something that would be useful and beneficial uh, for his citizens and for his state's economy, and pushed through a law allowing prize link savings uh, programs to be put into place in Washington state. He's here now serving in the glorious mess that is Congress. Uh, we're delighted to have him and look forward to hearing about his experience in Washington State uh, and, and whether he sees uh, opportunities to take these kinds of uh, initiatives that he championed at the state level uh, uh, national. Please join me in welcoming Representative Kilmer. Thanks so much. Um, I was told to speak uh, just for about 15 minutes, and I'm going to do something a little unusual. I'm going to speak for less than that and then show a brief video and then uh, wrap up a little bit. This is um, the second most challenging speaking engagement I've ever had. The first most challenging speaking engagement that I had was in front of the um, children of South Colby Elementary School in Port Orchard, Washington. I was their Veterans Day speaker, uh, preschool through fifth grade, uh, 20 minutes. Um, <laughs> and I walk into this gymnasium, and there's you know preschool through fifth grade. 20 minutes, and I went up to one of the teachers and said, you know, I'm screwed. You know, what do I do? And she gave me the best advice I've ever gotten in my entire time in public service. She said, here's the deal. Say whatever it is you got to say. Say it in whatever amount of time you got to say it in. But if you see any of the kids start picking their noses, wrap it up. Um, <laughs> which, frankly, I just think is good words to live by. So um, if you feel like I'm running a little long, you know what to do. Um, uh, I, it is, um, I want to give a little bit of, of um, context for how I got into this. And actually, the person who got me into this is in the room, my friend from college, Nick Maynard. Um, but let me step back a little earlier than that. Um, I, I grew up uh, in timber country of Washington State in a town called Port Angeles. And when I was going through school, it was right around the time the timber industry was taking, taking it on the chin. I saw a lot of my friends' parents lose their jobs, a lot of my neighbors lose their jobs. It had a huge impact on me. And um, uh, so when I met Nick in college, I was actually looking at how do you help timber towns in Washington State. That's what got me into working in economic development professionally. And now I represent a district that has both uh, a substantial amount of challenges in terms of developing our rural economy, and it also has Tacoma, which is, um, has some challenges in, in, uh, on, in the area of what's known as the hilltop, um, and in South Tacoma in terms of developing assets and trying to build that local economy. When I was uh, uh, serving in our state legislature, I reached out to Nick mostly to check in because he was a friend from college that I tried to occasionally leave, uh, keep in touch with. And he talked to me about the organization that he was working for and involved with asset building. And I said, well, give me an example of what you're up to. And he shared this concept of price link savings, which I just thought was a really cool idea. And I said, well, I'd love to partner with you guys to do something about it. You heard some of the statistics around why this matters. Uh, you know, a third of Americans have no savings at all. And in areas like that which I represent, that means one of two things. Either people um, end up potentially sleeping in their cars, but, or they rely on credit cards or payday loans. Um, to deal with unexpected costs and face really substantial repayment rates. You know, we see why savings matter in areas like mine. You know, it can help us weather those financial ups and downs. Uh, it helps us weather 
job losses like we've seen way too much of in recent years. It helps you weather medical emergencies. You know, it also enables you to sock some money away for big investments. Um, and uh, it's a way to invest for the future, whether that be in education or retirement or something else. You know, more broadly, you know, if you look in the aggregate, our country is lagging on this. You know, we rank 26th uh, among the OECD countries, um, which puts us uh, right near the bottom. Um, it also means that we are more dependent on uh, on borrowing money from abroad, which doesn't serve our, our national interest as well. So that's, that's sort of why this matters. Um, so what we did at the, in Washington state was uh, we passed a law that simply allows financial institutions um, to offer new product to encourage savings. So let me give you an example of how this will work. Uh, six of Washington state's credit unions recently debuted what they're calling save to win accounts. Uh, credit union members are entered into a cash prize drawing for every $25 of savings deposit. If you, make a de if you make more deposits, you get more chances to win. You don't lose anything in the process. The worst thing that can happen to you is you suck away a bunch of money. Um, all savings deposits uh, remain in the members' accounts, and the prizes are paid from a separate pool of, uh, of funds. In Washington State, the prize pool is um, funded for three years by Strategic Link, which is a uh, subsidiary of our Northwest Credit Union Association. There's going to be multiple uh, monthly uh, drawings that will offer savers the opportunity to win from 50 bucks to $5,000, and there will be an annual grand prize drawing of $5,000 uh, offered next year. You know, the initial feedback we've gotten has been actually really, really positive. Um, uh, Twin Star Credit Union and Fiber Federal Credit Union together have already opened 60 accounts in just the, the past few weeks. I know that the Connection Credit Union has been working with the, um, with the social service provider in our neck, neck of the woods called Kitsap Community Resources and with Am American Financial Resources to make sure that these products are, are targeted towards the folks that we're intending to serve here so that they can actually build some assets. So it's been a, a very good start, even though we just kicked this off. Um, and we'll be seeing more from participants over the next uh, many months. One of the things I was asked about was uh, I was asked to uh, give a presentation on the lessons learned from this. And this morning I was talking with my chief of staff and said, you know, it's odd. I actually did a video on lessons we learned from this. And I thought maybe I should just show the video. So um, are you all cool watching like a eight minute video? Okay. So I don't know who I point to to say show the video, but you? The man behind the curtain. The man behind the curtain. Yes. So, all right. Hello, everyone. I'm Derek Kilmer, a Washington State me, Senator yeah. and sponsor of a new law here in Washington to allow prize link savings. I'm sorry I can't be with you today, but I'm here in Olympia working on our state budget, which means I'm both too busy to be with you and I'm acutely aware of the fact that my state can't afford to buy a plane ticket for me to be there. It struck me that it might be a little bit boring for you guys to sit and watch me yammer away on a screen. So in an effort to spice things up a little, I figured I would give you the top 10 things I learned in sponsoring a prize link savings bill. Okay, are you ready? Here are the top 10 things I learned in sponsoring a prize link savings bill. Number 10, it's really good to keep in touch with friends from college. The dirty secret that most legislators won't tell you, that I will tell you, is that very few of us have good ideas of our own. Some of us just know smart people. I was lucky enough to get in touch with Nick Maynard from Doorway to Dreams. He's a buddy of mine from college. I asked him what he was up to, and he said that he was working on trying to help people build assets and make their way out of poverty. In that conversation a couple of years ago, he told me what many of you already know. Too many of our families have borrowed more than we've saved. In fact, one third of Americans report no savings at all. Many of us depend on higher interest forms of money, like payday lenders and credit cards. He also reinforced to me the value of savings. Savings help us weather financial ups and downs like illness or, as is too often the case these days, job loss. It enables us to sock some money away for significant purchases. It was a really good and a really important conversation. So my first lesson, my number 10, is pick up the phone and call that old buddy from college. Little caveat here, do not call a former girlfriend or boyfriend from college. I tried that a few years ago, just really awkward. Number nine, come up with a simple, smart way to solve the problem. So how did we propose solving the problem? Well, 
After conferring with Nick, we passed a new law to allow our financial institutions to offer new products to provide incentives for savings. The law referred to it as prize-linked savings. The local newspapers referred to it as rewards for thrift. As an old Dire Straits fan, I like to think of it as money for nothing. Let me give you an example of how it works in some states. A person could open a 12-month CD with an initial deposit as low as $25 and is able to make additional deposits throughout the year. As they do, their savings earn interest, and as they save, they earn chances to win cash prizes. No matter what you call it, the idea is to make savings fun. Number eight, it's important to have the right prize. We thought it made a lot of sense to have incentives to save, but there was a lot of debate about what the incentives should be. There were three ideas that were rejected prior to landing on cash prizes. Our first idea for an incentive was a chance to babysit my five-year-old. This is my daughter, Sophie. She's super cute, and I thought it would be really fun for people to have the opportunity to hang out with her. For some reason, people didn't think that would be a cool prize. Second, we were thinking something entertaining or maybe sports oriented, so I proposed a DVD of the greatest hits from the 2011-2012 NBA season. Apparently, not a winner. Third, I suggested providing folks with a deep fried Snickers bar. Seriously, I tried one at the Washington State Fair this year and it was so good. My doctor says I'm not supposed to eat them, but I'm telling you, I would save so much money if I was given a deep fried Snickers bar. Having rejected my cool ideas, we moved on to cash prizes. While cash doesn't taste as good as a deep fried Snickers bar and isn't as cute as my daughter, a small cash prize can let you take your family out for a movie. A big cash prize can help pay the rent or have an even greater impact. As the great philosopher Puff Daddy once wrote, it's all about the Benjamins. Number seven, repeat after me. This is not a new government program. If you live in a state like mine, you've been going through enormous budget problems. Last time I looked, 48 of the 50 states had budget shortfalls. The two that didn't were Montana and North Dakota, and it's because they stand on mineral deposits. I've been digging in my backyard, but nothing. Just a bunch of sand. In light of those budget challenges, I've found that there's not a lot of appetite among Democrats or Republicans to create new government programs when we're cutting the bejeebers out of everything else. The good thing here is that this is not a new government program. It was simply a proposal to allow the private sector financial institutions to offer a new product to help people save. At some point, it had to become a bit of a mantra. This is not a new government program. Repeat after me. This is not a new government program. All right, number six. Unfortunately, due to recent budget reductions, the number six most important thing I learned in sponsoring a prize link savings law had to be eliminated from the list. Please know that I worked hard to ensure that number seven and number five picked up the slack. Number five, the thing about a win-win is that nobody wants to lose. We started off this effort by forming a coalition of folks who were naturally supportive of this idea. The Asset Building Coalition worked on anti-poverty efforts already, so they were nat natural participants. The credit unions, too, were on board from the start. They saw it as an opportunity to provide a valuable service and create more clients. But we found that other folks were interested, too, sometimes in a supportive way and sometimes in a concerned way and sometimes in a supportive but concerned way. It became a little like the whack-a-mole game from Chuck E. Cheese's. The first mole that needed whacking were the financial institutions. Initially, we focused our bill solely on credit unions, but got some pushback from the banks, so we amended our proposal to include them. That gave our state Department of Financial Institutions some heartburn. In the end, we included all financial institutions if and when the federal government gives the green light for banks to participate. In addition, a number of folks were anxious because they perceived this proposal to be an expansion of gambling. We tried to explain that these were promotions without any losers. The worst thing that happens is that you can save some dough. Nevertheless, we had to do a substantial amount of outreach to our state gambling commission and to the Native American tribes in our state. By the end, everyone was cool with the idea, but it took some work and a lot of outreach to everybody. All right, number four. The number four thing I learned, particularly in doing so much outreach to everyone, is that there is a fundamental difference between reply and reply all. I'm not going into the details here, but I really encourage you to be careful with the email. Number three, data talks. As we pursued this legislation, we got a lot of good data from states that had already enabled price link savings. 
Several states already authorize these programs, and the data are compelling. In location after location, you see an increase in savings account, an increase in the amount saved, more low-income account holders. Whenever we brought some data to the party, people from all political philosophies saw real value. Another little caveat here. Do not, and I repeat, do not make up the data. I've seen this attempted. It doesn't work out. Number two, you know what does work? What does work is when things get tough, you just give in and eat a deep fried Snickers bar. Man, I will tell you, those things are so good. All right, number one. And finally, the most important thing I learned was that if you propose a program that costs the state nothing, is proven to help people save and build wealth, doesn't expand gambling, has no losers, and creates a lot of winners, then you have a pretty good chance of succeeding. I know that not every state has had this experience, but I think the more states that do enable prize-linked savings accounts, the more other states will want to give them a try. All right? Thanks so much for listening. Now go call that old friend from college. It's better than me talking, right? I mean, all right. Yeah, the, um, the Snickers is actually really good. Uh, <laughs> um, let me just say in closing, um, I mentioned in the video, one of the challenges that we're seeing in a number of states who are trying to tackle this is this, uh, uh, this fact that banks aren't able to participate. So we've been doing some outreach here uh, to see if this concept can be expanded to, to, um, to, to banks as well. Um, and we're looking closely at, at whether, whether there's an opportunity for national legislation. You know, I think it still ought to be up to the states uh, to adjust their laws to allow banks and credit unions to offer these types of products. But if the federal government can at least set the table for them to, to do it uh, better and do it easier, I think that makes some sense. I also think we need to be vigorous in looking at the experience of the states that have done this. Um, as my state weighs into this, Michigan, North Carolina, Nebraska, um, I think it, it, again, data talks. And the more we look at the, the experiences of those states and can learn from them to figure out how to make this better, uh, we, will, uh, we will benefit from that. Uh, so with that, um, I don't see too many people picking their noses. But uh, uh, I, wanna, I, I was told to leave a couple minutes for questions, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you all might have. Yes, sir. Someone actually wants to hear what I have to say. Uh, the, um, I'm curious what kind of research has been done on the, um, I mean, there's a lot of ways to offer lotteries, um, big prizes, not very many, lots of small prizes. One idea that is, uh, I've seen float around, which I find intriguing, is this thing called a uh, regret lottery, where you set up an objective. So you have to increase your savings by X percent, and uh, everybody's name is drawn from the lottery, but only those who succeeded at meeting the objective actually get the prize. So they, they regret having not gotten the prize, and maybe they're a little embarrassed not having gotten the prize. I'm not saying that that particular strategy, but I'm curious how much thought went into, you, you kind of alluded to it, I mean, with your, you know, the daughter in the Snickers bar, but I'm sure that yeah. also there was some thinking related to actually on the uh, money side, what to offer? In, in our state, the conversation has been driven by the credit unions, actually. Th they're determining how best to structure this. And my guess is the folks from Doorway to Dreams might have more analysis of this. You know, it's, you know, I think you're getting at the issues of intermittent positive reinforcement, so. Hi, I'm Will Gerardo with the CDFI Fund. You talked a little bit about how you've had to work with uh, Native communities. Can you expand a bit more about the process? Yeah, the, the, there was initial, uh, initially concern from the tribal communities in our state, uh, largely because many of them have, um, uh, have tribal gaming and it's um, important to their tribal economic development. And so they raised some concerns as seeing that this might be a potential uh, competitor to them. As we walk through what this is, and more importantly, what this isn't, uh, their comfort level went up substantially. And part of that was simply, you know, it's, it's, it's a requirement of any of us who sponsor legislation to try to do an adequate job of explaining it.
So in the end, the conversation was, was actually pretty smooth. Some were, but there, almost all of them were just neutral on it. Um, and we had a couple who, particularly in light of some of the poverty that we've seen in rural parts of, of, of our state, um, some were pretty bullish about it. Right. Have you, um, so in, in some models, this is, gets back to another model question a little bit. In some models, people uh, are asked to give up a portion of the interest or the interest that they would be earning on these types of accounts. Now, you know, uh, the House Federal Credit Union is offering people a quarter of a percentage point of interest right now. In this environment, that may not be seen as sort of uh, giving up very much. Yeah. But uh, do, you, do you know the details of, of whether folks in Washington state are being asked to give up uh, something? Or is it uh, the same as uh, any other savings? And why wouldn't I do it? Yeah, in our state, we actually left that up to the left that up to the credit unions to determine how they how they wanted to how they wanted to structure it and what they thought would actually encourage savings. Um, you know, I, I, I think that may, you know, there's a, there's a lot of variables involved there, including what the interest rate is at, at, at any given time. We had that conversation as we were drafting the legislation to decide, you know, what, do we want to, do we want to define that variable up front? And in the end, we, let it, we left it up to, to, to those that were going to run this. Hi, I'm Alex Kaufman from, from the Federal Reserve Board. Um, I just was wondering, um, is it um, currently in Washington or in any other states, is it possible for like non-bank, non-credit union financial, financial institutions to offer this sort of thing? Like thinking about like online stuff like, you know, PayPal or storefront financial institutions, things like that. I, as I think about the legislation that we passed in my state, um, it, I don't think that those would be uh, eligible for it. Um, I don't know about the other states. So it, is it only credit unions? Yeah, they have currently? to be a certified financial institution of the state of Washington. So. Mm -hmm. You mentioned looking at some things here in, I guess, in, on the federal level. In the UK, these are called premium bonds, and they're sold online and through the post office. We all know the post office here is in dire straits for something <laughs> to do. I wonder if you were looking at seeing if the post office would be a distribution point. I hadn't looked at that, but it's interesting. All right, I'm getting the hook. Yep. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Congressman Kilmer. Uh, uh, we really appreciate it and uh, uh, very excited to have him here today and, and looking forward to see sort of where the possibilities for this lie. I actually think that we had a couple of uh, questions that segued us very nicely uh, into our next panel where we're going to uh, dig in deeper with some content experts uh, who know a little bit more about some of these uh, items. So if I can ask uh, Representative May Flexer and Stuart Butler and Joanna smith Ramondi to come and join me, that would be terrific. And I actually think we're going to just uh, sit down and have a conversation. And uh, um, Representative Flexer, if you'd take us away, that would be great. Well, thank you all uh, for inviting me here to speak with you this morning. Um, my name is May Flexer. I'm a state representative in Connecticut. And uh, this year, I think we're going to have great success with passing legislation to allow prize link savings uh, in our state. This idea in Connecticut initially came from a number uh, of different legislators. Some of us had learned about it through Joanna and Doorways to Dreams uh, at a con conference of the National Conference of State Legislatures. Um, others had introduced similar legislation in the past and had not found success. And so this year, uh, we all came together to put this legislation forward. I represent a, a portion of Connecticut where uh, it's a rural area and it's where people really struggle to get by and oftentimes people might think that, that Connecticut uh, is a place where 
there's a lot of wealth, but I would argue that Connecticut is unfortunately a place where there's a, a wide gap between the haves and the have-nots. And so a program like this is especially important to me uh, and to my constituents and to the other legislators who have introduced this legislation. We luckily have a really broad coalition uh, of folks that are, are introducing this this year. And we were able to start having conversations uh, as early as last summer and fall with our leadership and with key stakeholders in order to build momentum and to find the success that we've had thus far, and hopefully we're going to continue to see when the House votes on this legislation uh, tomorrow. We've been able to garner the support of uh, credit unions from throughout the state and community banks, and also from uh, natural allies, advocates for economic security um, have come to the table and, and helped us with this legislation. And we've also faced some concern from uh, anti-gambling groups. We've tried to address some of their concerns. One of the things we're doing in our legislation is to uh, make a requirement that you can't participate in this program unless you're uh, over the age of 18. And uh, we've tried to, to have serious conversations, as uh, Representative Kilmer stated, that there are no uh, losers in this program, that this really does encourage people to save. And, and when having conversations with folks who have concerns about gambling behavior, I've shared my own experience. Um, when I was a kid, I remember my mom constantly telling us as she bought lottery tickets that she was going to win and we were going to go to Disney World. Well, guess what? We never went to Disney World, and perhaps if she'd taken that $5, $10 she spent every week on lottery tickets and putting, put it in a prize link savings account, perhaps we would have one day gone to Disney World, with or without actually winning the prize. So um, we are uh, excited about this legislation. It is enabling, it allows credit unions in Connecticut and community banks to offer uh, savings promotional raffle, raffles under special conditions. There's gonna be regulations put together by our State Department of Banking, and those raffles are gonna be subject uh, to audits. And, and that basically um, sums up the the legislation, it, it's enabling. We're looking forward to finding success tomorrow in the House. We have broad bipartisan support in both the House and the State Senate. And once the bill passes the House and hopefully passes the Senate, we look forward to working with all of those stakeholders to actually put this program in place at our credit unions and community banks. Thank you. That's great. Thank you so much. Stuart, uh, we had a question about <laughs> premium bonds in the UK. You've done a lot of work looking at uh, the international context. Uh, what can you tell us? Yes, uh, and thank you for uh, inviting me to speak today. I'm very uh, supportive of this uh, uh, whole approach. And I'll talk a little bit about that as well as sort of generally how we sort of think about uh, uh, prize-linked uh, savings. My uh, particular interest is in the whole area of economic mobility. Why do some people move up the economic ladder uh, while others don't? And I think it's fair to say that when you look at the distribution of wealth and income in this country, um, the problem is not that Warren Buffett saves too much and, in, and invests too much. The problem is, as we've heard, it's the bottom third of the population that is saving nothing and investing nothing. And that's what we've got to focus on in terms of, of dealing with this. Uh, and also that that population, as we've heard, uh, is more inclined to think about um, protecting the future by gambling in some way uh, rather than a systematic um, uh, savings and, and investment strategy. You've also heard that when people do, in fact, have a, a habit of savings, not only does it build up wealth and therefore give them protections from shocks and also allows them to invest uh, in, in, uh, in many things to improve their situation, but it's also linked to other patterns too. People who save regularly tend to have longer time horizons. They tend to delay gratification. They tend to do things that not only um, a result of the savings itself, but also encourages them to act in ways that will make it more likely that they will acquire the human capital and so on to move up the economic ladder. So it's really important to focus on how to build a habit of savings. And I think when you do this, it's very important to recognize that there are two sides to the brain. Uh, there's the left side to the brain, the logic, rational side, which is very important to appeal to. Uh, it's very important to look at things like financial literacy, to try to explain to people and convince them that it really makes sense to put money aside uh, and so on. And a lot of people, a lot of organizations do this. And it's very important as a part of the equation. Organizations like EARN in uh, San Francisco focus on low-income people to encourage them to save and so on. But it's also important to look at the right side of the brain, the emotional side, 
Uh, and for a lot of people, that works a lot better to get them to do things that are in their self-interest than talking to them rationally, although both, of course, uh, are necessary. And the critical thing about this approach that we're talking about today is that essentially it recognizes this factor of the right side of the brain, the impulse, the desire to gamble and so on, and says, how can we actually turn that impulse into a positive goal that establishes a long-term habit change? That's actually uh, what this is doing. And there are, there are various ways to, to do this, to accomplish this. We have a, a draft paper uh, outside that you're very welcome to pick up. Um, which just looks at a whole range uh, of, of approaches, including the international side. And I think you, uh, when you look at this, you can, you can look at this sort of appeal to the right brain in terms of, th of three different general approaches. Um, one is sort of what we've heard uh, a little bit about already, ideas like Save to Win, which I know which you're going to hear a lot more about in a moment, which basically say let's pool the, uh, the earnings you would have on a, on a traditional savings in a credit union, let's pool that, and then let's sort of entice people by saying, you got a chance to kind of win the whole amount or win a big chunk, rather than getting a boring, small interest on what you are, are saving. And that's one strategy, which, uh, 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 as I said, you'll hear a lot more about in a moment. Um, a second strategy is to use the bond system, the idea of investing in a bond for a long period, to, to lock in capital for uh, a period, and take the interest you would normally have on a bond and turn that into um, a pool of, of, of prizes that can be distributed to people uh, in a certain way. And that's what the British uh, uh, premium bond system does. Um, in this case, like any bond, the principal is kept intact. You don't lose it like you, get, uh, uh, in a, uh, like you would in a lottery. Uh, but just like a lottery, uh, the potential winnings are, are pooled together and then uh, distributed. And there's been an interesting kind of uh, experimentation there. This is a program that began in 1957. Um, interesting ways of, of calibrating savings, uh, the returns rather, the prizes, to see what is the way in which it's more likely to induce people to actually save. And in the UK, they have big prizes, not like the Powerball here, but a million pounds, which do. British people is a lot of money. Uh, but it also has a lot of smaller prizes that seem to be very effective in inducing people uh, to save. In fact, when I was in the UK uh, in, uh, in December, uh, visiting my brother and, uh, and my nephews, my nephew Felix uh, was very excited because that morning he'd got in the mail uh, his, uh, one of his prizes from the premium bond. And I actually have a picture of it here to show that I'm telling the truth. Uh, for 25 pounds, uh, which he kind of could count on every, you know, maybe about every quarter. Uh, and he was uh, texting all his friends, and they were going to go out to the pub, uh, and he was going to stand them uh, uh, some drinks on this 25 uh, pounds. And that really got him kind of excited. I remember when my father, uh, back in the 60s, uh, started buying premium bonds. And every month, we would all gather around the television to see uh, who was going to get the big prize. He also got small prizes, and he was very uh, excited. Now, I was a, uh, a smart-ass uh, uh, teenager at the time, and I said to my dad, well, this isn't particularly rational. It would be just as good to put the money aside in a savings account, and so on, and so on. But I was talking to the wrong side of his brain. Uh, what he was interested in was the thrill of the chance of making of getting a winning like that. And indeed, when the premium bonds were introduced in Britain, they were described as savings with a thrill. You know, left brain, right brain, savings with a thrill. And, and that was, that's very important in terms of understanding why these things are so attractive. Well, now, 40% of all adults uh, in the United, uh, sorry, of all adults and children in the United States, in, in, the, in the UK, uh, actually have premium bond accounts. And we now have over 70 billion, the equivalent of $70 billion invested in this. It's been a huge growth area. So that's the second form, using the bond mechanism, combining it with a lottery in order to induce people to save. And the third is kind of really interesting because it's not exactly the same as a lottery. But the idea of, of, of combining savings or debt reduction with a sweepstakes model Sweepstakes are not lotteries. Sweepstakes are when, as you know, when you maybe go somewhere looking for cars or something, you can enter a sweepstakes, you don't have to buy anything, you just have to show up, and then you've got the chance of winning uh, a prize. 
Sweepstakes are therefore a little different from, from lotteries, but are the same kind of structure of trying to induce people to, to save in some way. Uh, they're legal everywhere already, which is a big ad advantage of them. Um, they induce savings even though um, they're not pooling the money or in any way um, using that uh, interest as, 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 as prizes. What they do is use essentially advertising revenue going in line with the savings uh, to, to finance um, prizes of various kinds, not just money, but actual sort of physical prizes uh, uh, as well. And they use essentially a point system to give you chances to enter the, the sweepstakes. So the more you build up savings, the more you get points, which then allows you to enter the sweepstake, which is financed from advertising, because you have to see the adverts when you do this. And that's how that's financed. So it's a, very, it's a subtly different uh, form. And an organization uh, um, um, called Save Up uh, has pioneered this in the last uh, uh, 12 months. And we've already seen a, a huge expansion in, in both savings. And they also build in a debt reduction sort of element to the equation as well. So you can get points by reducing debt or expanding savings. So this is a, this is a variant on the general theme that we're talking about today. So when you look at this, there, there can be various ways of, of doing this, of basically combining this, uh, the saving strategy, uh, the logic of that, the rationality, with this um, appeal to an emotion to encourage people to do things which is in their self-interest uh, and will we'll make it more likely they will succeed uh, in the future. And that's why I think these approaches are so important. When you look at what it takes to cause people to move up the economic ladder, there are many things. It's not just what we're talking about uh, here. Uh, it is things like education, it is things like strong communities, families, and so on. But there's no question that encouraging people to save systematically and build a habit of saving and do that by appealing, as I said, to both sides of the brain is absolutely critical in terms of encouraging people to be enabled to achieve the American opportunity and the American dream that is so important today. Thank you. So Joanna Stewart's given us uh, some of the bigger context, uh, other countries and the different models that are out there. And we've had other folks tell us a little bit about, we've mentioned some of the other states. Can you sort of fill those pieces in for us and tell us sure. um, uh, what's happened where, uh, where this momentum has, has come from and, and where we think it's going? Yeah, sure, I'd be happy to. So we've been working with the prizing savings concept, we call it, at Doorways to Dreams Fund since 2006, 2007, you know, really working to launch an actual pilot in the United States in 2008. Um, and where it comes for, from us is this need that, you know, we need to change people's engagement and people's relationship with savings. It's just not working the way we do it now, frankly. And our point of view is that you need big, audacious ideas to do that. And so we are stealing from international experience to translate that into what works in the US. And there's been an enormous amount of momentum, Justin, as you mentioned. Since 2009, when the first kind of Save to Win, and we have plenty of research on the experience in Save to Win on our website, um, has launched. We've had six states pass enabling legislation. We are looking to our seventh, right to my left. Um, four states have launched a product to the tune of over 42,000 accounts and $74 million saved. So significant impact for those of you who work in the asset building world. Think about what it would take to get another kind of savings product, match savings account, tax time savings, whatever it is to scale like this. I mean, this is a lot of people, a lot of dollars saved. And frankly, from a public policy perspective, we think it's doing its job. Um, roughly 50 to 79%, depending on the state, of account holders have some financial, financially vulnerable characteristic. They don't already have savings. They are actually low to moderate income. Um, they have never saved before. You know, there are different ways that we categorize them. We actually have a recent report sitting outside there for you if you want to look more into that. But so think about it. More than half of account holders before they were saving were financially vulnerable. 
that's really good public policy in action and public policy impact. Um, we also see that a third are actually LMI, so low to moderate income. This is a product offer on the market. It's very important that it is attractive to a variety, a diverse set of consumers. Um, otherwise, it just won't be sustainable, really, from a market economics perspective. But the fact that given that context, we still have a large percentage of folks who are low to moderate income says to me product features are right and they're successful, and the public policy is doing what it's supposed to do. Um, and over 50 percent, at least in Nebraska, where we've been asking this question, don't have any other financial reserve. I mean, oh my goodness, right? They had nothing. They came into this account, and now they're sitting on average with you know, $500, $700, $1,000 in an account. That is you know, money between you and financial catastrophe for your family. So we think it's really successfully building into an emergency savings product, which is also very exciting to see kind of on the market, easily accessible, but with the fun. And, and that's why folks are joining. Some of the other work that we're doing now to say, OK, we've learned this lesson. It's been four years working in the primarily credit union industry. Huge success, a lot of commitment from credit unions in North Carolina, Nebraska, Michigan, uh, Washington State, and all of their credit union leagues is, you know, where else do we go from here to get to scale? Um, to that end, it has been no secret that we have been very bullish on this idea of what role could the lottery play? So in our crazy d to d brains, we sort of look at the world and say, what assets already exist? What infrastructure already exists? Where is it overlaying in the marketplace that we want to be at? And I have to tell you, the lottery is like a straight on bullseye. Um, we have a recent report out there about our new work in the lottery space and a lot of the research that we've done, new research on consumer interest in this. But when you think about it, the lottery has over 240,000 retail outlets in the country. That is at least four times what you see in financial institution branches. They have legal authority to offer games of chance, which is an enormous hiccup in trying to get financial institutions to be able to offer this. They already are in neighborhoods where financially vulnerable folks conduct business or work or live. And they know how to do fun. And they are attractive to people and already are a source of financial planning for many consumers. So again, we're looking at new channels. We're working with a handful of states to really figure out, OK, this is an idea. What does it mean in practice? What does it mean in concept? We have um, scratch. I don't even have one on me. But we have these lottery scratchers that we mocked up for everyone. Oh, thank you, Stuart. <laughs> so that you can really conceive of this idea of what would it mean to scratch and save your way into financial security and good times. Um, so it's a real scratcher. Really, please scratch it. Um, you can see if you won, but everyone wins a candy bar because everyone wins in Prizeling Savings. Um, but you know, really doing our best to help visualize, conceptualize, and of course build a business model for how the case would work. Um, but we're you know, we're excited about kind of the access that would be expanded through lottery. We're really encouraged by the access that's being expanded through the credit union sphere. And we're really looking to leadership like Congressman Kilmer and others to say, well, how do we create a more inclusive regulatory environment such that fina all financial institutions, not just credit unions, have an open space to play? Um, and so, you know, we're eager to work with the federal level to really say, you know, one, government should be pro-savings. It just totally makes sense from a policy perspective, and we need to figure out what's, you know, making it hard for lottery to offer savings, what's making it hard for banks to offer prizeling savings. Um, and that when we're thinking about all savings policy, frankly, not just prizeling savings policy, saving needs to be immediately gratifying. It has to have features that do that or people won't do it. Savings has to be fun. It just is, right? There are a lot, I mean, good grief. We just saw such a terrible tragedy yesterday. We need things in our life that are fun, that help us engage, that bring lightness to it, especially when finances are such a heavy topic. Um, savings has to be engaging, or you just don't continue to do it, right? You deposit once, you go away. That doesn't build anything. And savings needs to continually have fresh and new pieces to it, features to it, ways it interacts with you, or you're just going to stop. I want to um, I want to dig into sort of the path forward, but let's um, take a step back before we do that a little bit. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about why you the decisions that you guys have made in designing the bill in Connecticut? Um, you know, Stuart sort of uh, laid out these sort of different approaches. Have you recommended a specific approach in Connecticut, or 
or or you like Washington State leaving that up to uh, the credit unions and other participants to say this is the model that we're going to uh, to adopt and and we'll see what emerges from sort of a marketplace of ideas. Our legislation in Connecticut is um, very similar to what Representative Kilmer talked about uh, in Washington in terms of empowering credit unions and community banks to engage in this type of programming. The parameters in the bill you know, do require certain regulations through the Department of Banking and, and qualify who can run these types of programs. But we are um, hoping that they're going to sort of run themselves, although I would say that one of the we intend, as legislators, we intend to be a part of that conversation of setting the program up going forward. While we think that you can't legislate every nuance that a program like this uh, may need, we're hoping to be at the table as the credit unions and banks start to set up these programs. Can you legislate fun? No. <laughs> no. No, no, I, no I, uh, but is there, you know, is there, are there aspects of this where you are um, suggesting or I encouraging participants to uh, to to think outside of the box and, and to do that, or do you think that sort of the idea in in and of itself is going to lend itself to creative marketing? We think the idea is going to lend itself uh, to creative marketing, and you know one of the concerns that we had gotten actually from anti-gambling organizations was specifically about the marketing, and so one of the and they wanted us to legislate that, and mm -hmm. and we thought that went beyond the the parameters of what we were trying to do. But one of the ways we've tried to allay those concerns is by saying that we will be at the table to make sure that the marketing for these programs is responsible, does uh, promote both fun and savings, but does so in an appropriate way. And what's the, what's the mechanism for you guys to remain at the table? Is there a, a review? Is there a board that's supposed to gather? It's more of an informal agreement right, that, that right. we are to continue to right. be a part of the conversation. Right. I found it really interesting that one of the measures that you had to take in order to inoculate this proposal from some of the, some of the um, anti-gambling uh, opponents, I, I think you said, uh, was to make sure that uh, no one under 18 can participate. Uh, that's that's really interesting. We've talked a great deal about sort of children's savings accounts and uh, and and the the possibility uh, that's offered when you get kids invested in in saving early. And and I think a lot of the folks here on the panel and maybe in the audience would sort of agree that that there's a lot of um, promise there. And I'll be very interested to see. I understand sort of the decision you've made at this point. I'll be very interested to see if um, if this leads in the future. Uh, to you know, to productive experimentation uh, on the possibilities of connecting kids to savings accounts um, early. Uh, let's transition a little bit and let's talk a little bit about the path uh, forward. Um, uh, Stuart, I, you know, I, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Uh, the one would say uh, that uh, the traditional uh, heritage approach to this would be for people like uh, Representative Flexer to do what they're doing, to have um, the states uh, be the arbiters uh, of this as an idea. Uh, and the fact that there are six and maybe soon seven states that have adopted this is, is proof that that approach is, is working. Um, I also see uh, uh, Joanna's point that uh, government should be pro-savings as one uh, that, w that we consider to be valid. Um, uh, and there's uh, tax reform staring us in the face. And uh, through the tax system, the government, particularly uh, the federal government, uh, essentially defines the entire universe of retirement savings products, uh, as far as most Americans are concerned, um, and has a lot of impact on, um, on other aspects of savings. Um, and something that's sort of come to light recently a little bit is uh, the extent to which uh, a focus on retirement savings only can uh, be self-defeating, uh, and people who have all of their savings tied up in a long-term account like a 401k uh, may end up losing a lot of money uh, when they have to crack open that 401k to meet emergency savings needs. So there's a bit of a tension there. Um, and then I also see a savings bond program that's uh, flailing. Uh, it's not as robust as it once was. Uh, and I see that the uh, as one of our questioners uh, asked earlier, what about the post office? Uh, the post office is prohibited by act of Congress uh, from competing in the financial services marketplace. Um, so I see a variety of areas where 
uh, national action uh, could address these questions and where there, there is a sort of precedent for the federal government's involvement in promoting uh, savings, sometimes not very well. Um, and so uh, talk to me a little bit about what you see with the path forward. Right. A lot of questions there. Yeah, but, uh, I started talking. <laughs> I, I think generally, I, I, as you heard from Representative Flexer, Flexer that uh, really what you want to try to do in this is to encourage as much innovation and experimentation as mm. possible, not just from the distribution of prizes, for example, which is one area, uh, but also what kinds of products uh, are offered. And, and, and all other things being equal, you'd obviously want that to be as locally you know, as further down the system as possible. But you're also correct that there are certain things at the federal level that either get in the way of this uh, or can, in fact, um, uh, inconsistent with good general policy and tax policy, can, can help uh, this as well. I mean, for example, you know, a lot of financial institutions are chartered at the federal level rather than the state level. So if you don't have compatible legislation at the federal level, uh, to enable federally chartered institutions uh, to, uh, to go in a similar direction, you're going to have a problem. You're also going to have a political problem because then you're going to see some institutions in a state saying, well, why should I, you know, these state chartered banks can do this and I can't, and so I'm going to try to oppose it. So for both, you know, good practical political reasons as well as consistency, you'd want to have uh, similar strategies at the state level. And that's one of the things that's very important. We talk a little bit about it in the paper that uh, uh, I mentioned outside in terms of the origins of the restrictions, which is related to gambling and, and so on. Uh, also, tax policy is very important. You're absolutely correct that, that uh, in order to induce people, encourage people to save and to invest generally, you do want to remove the double taxation elements in the, in the general code. Um, IRAs and, and retirement savings accounts, and actually also, of course, educational savings accounts, um, uh, do this uh, in, in limited areas today by not double taxing money you put in your IRA or 401k uh, plan. Um, we favor at Heritage, like a lot of people do, widening that generally to savings and say, if you save, then the savings themselves are not double taxed, no matter what you use it for. So that would encourage uh, people to save for emergencies, uh, to save, to um, have enough money to move, to get a better job, and all that sort of thing. So, so that's uh, very important. And then, of course, also, as, as you alluded to, the distribution network of uh, and what one can do to encourage that, um, enabling, of course, financial institutions to uh, offer these kinds of products is a huge increase in the availability of, uh, of outlets. But, of course, if you look by neighborhood, by income level and so on, you're going to tend to see fewer financial institutions in, in, in neighborhoods where you really want to encourage this. So it is important to have other institutions able to do that. I think the lottery system is a, uh, a real possibility and a good uh, idea. 7-Elevens, you know, lots of, uh, of, of institutions in neighborhoods have taken on a lottery component and they've got the basis for, for doing this. There's a number of issues to address there, but I think that makes a lot of sense. I'm also very interested in things like having intermediary institutions like churches and other organizations um, actually sort of do combined savings uh, systems. One of the things we learned from the research is very often, research generally, is if you tend to do something in, in, in tandem with other people, you're more likely to do it, whether it be going on a diet uh, or you know, having fun, uh, or savings. And so you know, when you see kind of pooled savings of, this na of that nature um, done through an institution, that's probably more likely to, to get people to, to keep doing things in a ha habitual way. So it's very important, I think, when you look at the federal level as well as the state level, to say, what are the impediments to institutions um, pooling savings, encouraging people to go into these prize-linked saving systems. Maybe the prize goes to the church rather than you. It still, does, it still can encourage people to, um, to save. So it's really important, I think, to look at that. And I think people on the cutting edge of this that are thinking this through are looking at those kinds of, of aspects too, the, the use of intermediary institutions as really important as part of this uh, inducement and collective kind of uh, uh, savings vehicles that then have this sort of a thrill aspect of, of the, the prize as the, as the core inducement to get people to sign up in the first place. 
Joanna, you, you uh, talked a lot about sort of the path forward uh, before. But um, Stuart raised something really interesting, which is, you know, 7-Elevens, right? And, and using different um, outreach tools and, and platforms to sort of connect with people. Can you talk a little bit about, in the states that have led the way on this, what's been done in, in the way of outreach and publicity? Have um, each of the participants been sort of on their own in terms of making the most of the, they can of the product they offer? Or have there been any coordinated campaigns? Sure. Um, so it's varied slightly, but effectively the credit unions are working together cooperatively on the singularly branded product. So it actually has all been saved to win in all these states, but the North Carolina credit unions work together, the Michigan credit unions work together, and so on, um, have one marketing campaign. They do a lot of work internally to market to existing members. That's purposeful. Uh, when we first started in Michigan, the credit unions that were participating sort of did an audit of their own membership and said, all right, so they're connected to financial services, check, but are they actually more financially secure as a result? Question mark, no check. Um, and said, you know, essentially there's just a lot of work we can do to shore up our own membership before we even go to the public, right? Uh, which I think was really thoughtful. I think in our asset building world, we say a lot about, well, are people connected or not? That's not enough, that is step one. Are they using it? Are they building emergency savings? Are they building financial reserves? That's probably the more important question, right? Are they getting access to the right product that's engaging them in a way that's leading to a better outcome? Um, so a lot of the marketing has been internal. We've been doing tests with different credit unions on how do you do texting, how do you do email reminders, you know, what is the sort of social media aspect? How do you keep people engaged, keep it fun, keep it more than just depositing um, to get folks very sort of committed and loyal to the product? And it's had varying success. I mean, it's an area to learn from. Um, there's a whole new buzzword in this world called gamification, you know, around all of these experiences. We have quite a bit of experience in not just through prizing savings, but through our financial entertainment work, with, which is really, you know, how do you totally reframe an experience so that you don't even know what you're learning through it, but you know, you're sort of getting it on the other end. My colleague Nick and our executive director call it broccoli with chocolate or something like that. Sounds mm -hmm. disgusting. Um, but it's better than broccoli. So, um, but you know, really thinking about these principles and not in a trite gimmicky way, but in a long-term relationship building, relationship management way. And that's what's been going on with the credit unions. A lot of testing, exploring, figuring out images. It's all really creative and super fun. Yeah. That's great. Stuart? I just have a very quick point about that, that really important issue, the gamification and so on. One of the things, for example, that Save Up does that I mentioned uh, earlier is you can do all sorts of things, but they're strictly games. They have nothing to do with prizes. And the logic of that is that getting people to kind of visit the site and engage in a game also has the byproduct of getting them to, to be more likely to kind of rack up points by reducing debt and so on. So it's, it is very important to kind of see this really is an investigation of the left brain, yeah, <laughs> really, right. side of the brain. It's what induces people to form habits and to be more likely to expose themselves to inducements to do good things rather than bad things. That's really what this is about. And, and so the whole research on behavioral economics, on, on how brain function, you know, really is critical to understanding uh, all, all these kinds of products and, and how they're structured. And it's, there's a lot more to be done in this area, and there will be. And I think you'll see a continuous refinement of these kinds of products based on really very hard science about how people make decisions or don't make decisions, or more inclined to do repeated things that are positive rather than negative. That's what a lot of this is really about. You know, that's interesting. You know, I think you know, there's, a, there's a comparison that can be made with almost what it sounds like people are hoping will happen with what actually has happened in a lot of other areas of the financial services marketplace. You think about the explosion of sort of prepaid debit cards, mm -hmm. right, and the vast array of features and products and fees and experimentation that's going on in that, in that space. And a lot of that, we would argue, um, uh, has some troubling aspects to it for the consumer. Um, you see sort of celebrity branded cards uh, that are, have really no value um, uh, for the consumer, 
uh, in comparison to other products in the marketplace other than the affiliation with the celebrity. And uh, there's real um, sort of questions about, yeah. about how we ought to move forward in that space. But we are seeing a, an incredible amount of experimentation. And we do hope that you know, with appropriate regulation from the CFPB and uh, uh, consumers hopefully applying some, uh, some lessons that there will be uh, uh, products that really work for people in that space okay. in the long run. Maybe now, the same I, I thing here. I think it's right to be, to be very good, concerned about you know, uh, of what you just said. On the other hand, uh, you know, you can imagine uh, what I call the gateway strategy. What mm. you're trying to do is to, uh, you may not ideally want a person to take the, the first step that they take by a, a, a celebrity-based card, but they but or get a card, but at least they're doing that step, and that may be the inducement. And then what you really want to do is to try to follow up with then how do you communicate with this person in such a way that you get them to make a rather more rational second step mm -hmm. decision. And I think that's a lot of what this is about. Um, and you've got to see it in stages that, uh, that way. You're trying to get people ultimately to say, even a, to form a habit which is completely rational and sensible and so on. But getting people to make the first steps, sometimes you've got to do it in a kind of creative way, which is not necessarily ideal. Right but at least gets to, to take the first step down a very important road that they're not taking at all right now. Right, that's a great point. I would like to uh, open it up to our audience for questions at this point. If folks would be so kind as to wait for the microphone, um, identify themselves and, and uh, use a question mark at some point, that would be uh, <laughs> tremendous. And also I'd like to sort of offer up the opportunity as we engage in conversation to our panelists to ask questions uh, of each other uh, with the same rules applying. Uh, do we have questions in the audience? Hi, I'm Barbara Littman with the Federal Reserve Board. Um, I wanted to ask a Representative Flexer about uh, conversations that you may have had with the Bankers Association in your state and what their position on this was from a you know competitive um, perspective. And it, am I allowed a second quick one to uh, Joanna? Can you talk about the interest among um, financial institutions in developing this as a source of small deposits? So initially, our effort in Connecticut was going to be um, focused on credit unions, and that was the part of the industry that we reached out to first and, and got their cooperation on. And then um, banks became interested in the, in the concept as well. And so we've been able to change our legislation to include community banks, state chartered banks. And um, we know that there's conversations happening at the federal level with the FDIC in terms of potentially enabling federally chartered banks uh, to take part in this. And if that, if those conversations continue to be productive and that moves forward, we'll be sure to amend our legislation to make sure that those types of financial institutions can participate as well. I think, um, you know, they're clearly frustrated by that, but they know that they're that we can't necessarily fix that for them. Um, yeah, I'll just add on to that and then answer the second question. You know, D to D is, of course, agnostic on the kind of financial institution that offers this product. <coughs> and it is our hope that it is inclusive. And we've seen in all the states we've worked with some level of interest from non-credit union financial institutions, so banks, state, and federally chartered. Um, but it is our understanding from legal counsel that there, something we've all sort of alluded to, very clear federal regulations around this for even state chartered banks. This becomes a political issue when we're trying to pass laws if only credit unions can actually offer it. But it also becomes sort of a consumer access issue where you really want consumers to be able to get you know, similar kinds of products at similar institutions. And this truly is something that federal regulators and federal policymakers can do something about. And it may not require literally an act of Congress. It could simply be you know, opinions and investigation by regulators. But at this point, we're all operating based on legal opinion and legislators such as Representative Flexer are sort of left out there trying to negotiate and all they want is for people to save in their state. Um, and so it's a pretty challenging situation, you know, that we believe there are some pretty prudent, you know, common sense ways to fix. Um, in terms of your question, Barbara, about other financial institutions and deposits, it's a, in the financial institution world right now, at least on the credit union side, there is this sort of general lack of interest in deposit taking. They have a ton of deposits. Um, 
And so it has been, I think that has impacted the results that we see in states. I mean, I am still incredibly impressed with 40,000 accounts and millions and millions of dollars on deposit, mostly by low-income consumers. But it is true right now that because of their balance books, they don't really want as many deposits. And so that has impacted sort of the willingness of some financial institutions to participate in the program, that is very cyclical. If you're in that world, you know that and things change. For those that have participated, they're sort of taking the long view that says, one, these aren't actually very big deposits. Like collectively, from an impact perspective, they are, but on their books, they don't feel so big. Um, from a mission perspective, we've got to do this, right? This is part of our charter, our goals. And third, financially secure customers mean borrowers in the future, and those are profit customers to us. And so what we really need to do is get, you know, build more financially secure members, customers now that can use our suite of products later. Um, more questions from the audience in the back? And then Hannah, come to the front a little bit afterwards. Will Gerardo from the CDFI Fund again. It sounds like the transactions involve you having to go into a brick and mortar of some sort. Is there an adaptation for mobile technologies of being able to have funds transferred online, have funds transferred from your uh, pay stub to go directly into this? Um, so, you know, there, there could be. I mean, technology is such a key driver in all access issues with financial services. Um, for many of the credit unions that we've been working with on the Save to Win product, people are setting up automatic you know, movement from accounts. So it just happens every month or splitting their paychecks. So that's happening without bricks and mortar. I have been very surprised in a good way at actually the amount of still branch-based traffic credit unions have. So they just are kind of a bricks and mortar place. And I do believe that this product requires a little bit of an explanation and a sales pitch, right? So you sort of need to be in the presence of someone. Um, but in terms of future technology, I mean, that's a lot of the work that we're doing in our not the paper out there, but a paper we have online called Playing the Savings Game. We go into some detail about different distribution channels that we're exploring, really to get to a national scale, one of which is thinking about prepaid cards and what you then do sort of online to create the engagement. Um, the technology of the lottery system is endless. You know, right now in Minnesota, they are testing um, at pilot locations whether or not you can get a lottery ticket when you pay for your gas. Are you kidding me? That's amazing. Why can't you also impulsively buy savings while you buy gas? I don't know who would, but I think it's very cool to test it. Um, but essentially that the lottery spends, and this is going to be a technical term, bajillion of dollars <laughs> investing in these amazingly sophisticated financial infrastructure that at this point we are just using to transmit lottery sales. But in other countries, they're using for a wide variety of other activities that we could really harness here. So there's super cool technology out there. There's a lot of you know really creative, cutting edge stuff, as Stuart mentioned. And we just, we are in a position in the US where we really have to figure out the regulatory side and how these things mingle and interact. I, I, I can just sort of add to that. I think you're absolutely on the right track there. And, and as, as you heard, I mean, the technology is developing uh, to such a pace that all kinds of things are possible. For example, um, when you look at, uh, we, we now have regular apps that allow you to monitor what's in your account. I mean, uh, you know, uh, apps like Mint and so forth. So, well, Save Up uses that, for example, uses that technology to know whether you're saving or, or reducing debt as an indicator whether you get points to go into a sweepstake. There's not, nothing is involved, you don't have to do anything. Um, it, it's simply an online kind of mechanism. When you look at the, at the prepaid card kind of notion, you think about prepaid phone cards, which, which are everywhere in, in lots of, of, of neighborhoods where people don't have online accounts and so on. Uh, there are various ways of using the smart card model in this way. So people, instead of taking, uh, you know, they buy something and there's, uh, you know, uh, 50 cents worth of change. Well, it can go directly onto a card, for example. I mean, the technology, I think, is endless. To make this easier and easier for people to do without a going somewhere or opening a, an account in a traditional sense. Um, and I think that's where a lot of the important growth is going to come, particularly for people who right now don't have accounts. The idea of walking in, for a lot of people, the idea of walking into a bank and sitting down with somebody and, and doing, this, doing something like this is, is so almost alien to their normal life. They just don't do it. They're actually afraid of it in many cases, They're afraid of going into institutions. So these devices that allow um, 
this process to be linked to something they're quite familiar with and comfortable with is indeed the kind of the beginning of the, what I call the gateway, getting them to do something in such a way that is completely natural, normal, and so on, and then over time may cause them to kind of gravitate towards more sophisticated uses of this, of this uh, model and larger uh, deposits and so on. That's the way I think. It's that first step which is so critical. I mean, that's what you see with people who don't save. It's not that people save a tiny amount. It's that they don't save at all. Once they start to save, then a habit forms, and that builds up over time. So it's that first interaction which is so critical in terms of the way the brain works in this sort of thing. And, and that's why I think you're right. The technology allows all kinds of ways of doing that, including you know, the, the, the game first step, nothing to do with savings, but gets you to start being familiar with a site to then start exploring it further and then doing the other things. That's what's so important here. And then the other thing that technology allows us to do is automation, which yes, right. for, for a lot of us takes this, takes that first step and turns it into a lifetime habit without, without the rest of it. It eliminates everything else. I think we have one more question in the audience up front here. You hold on for one second. We'll grab a microphone for you. Thank you. Um, first, yeah, it's new to me, so I need a little structure. Uh, there used to be, you're talking about credit unions. It used to be a thing where you had to be a member of a credit union to use a credit mm -hmm. union. I'm assuming that's no longer the case. Uh, I would like to know, just on a literal, individual basis, how this would work. Do I walk into a credit union, which I already have, all right, I don't have, ask for a form, then do I initially give them money? Mm -hmm. And this money, if I don't take anything out to use, is going to build up interest. And then is it going to be matched? I, don't, I still don't get how this works. Is it going to be matched by the credit union? And is the credit union um, relying on hundreds and hundreds of people to do this, that they're going to make money off of this product? See, I need a little more of a literal. Sure. Yeah, that's a great. And, um, and what happens with the prize, works. right? Does the, do you, does the prize go straight into the account? Do you get mailed a, a check? Do you get mailed a debit card with a lot of fees on it? Thank you very much, Virginia. <laughs> um, you know, uh, what, what happens, sure. uh, so, Joe? So there are a bunch of different, thank you for that question. Um, there are all these different models, but to simplify it, I'll explain the way that we have been piloting and testing in the United States in partnership with all of these credit unions. Um, real quickly, you still have to be a member to join a credit union. Many of them now have very broad membership guidelines so that credit unions now are more open and more accessible to more people. Including someone who lives in the state. Yeah, so it depends right. on the credit union, but many credit unions are if you live, work, breathe, worship, I'm not joking, like those words, then you can be a member. So. It's actually much easier to become a member than it used to be of a credit union. That's my credit union story. Um, in terms of the product, the product that they have decided to test and use is uh, what's called a balance building CD. So it's a certificate of deposit. You open it for $25. It has a term, one year from whenever you opened it to a year later. Um, the money is tied up for that year, but you can continue to deposit in that, to that account, which is pretty unique for a CD. Typically, you put all your money in up front, you come back to it in a year or five years, you decide if you're gonna roll it over or take it out. In this case, you can continue to build it, but the money is you know, sort of held so that you can't just withdraw all of it. The, for every $25 you deposit into this account, you get a chance to win a grand prize and monthly prizes. If you deposit into the account in a given month, you have a chance to win those monthly prizes. If you don't deposit that month, you can't win the monthly prizes you can still win a grand prize. So the goal with the monthly prizes is to engage you every month in depositing, otherwise you're missing chances to win. You're just leaving money on the table. Um, but to get you to build it really big and to keep it in there the full year, you've got a big old prize at the end because that's what attracts you to the account to begin with. Um, in the US, most of these accounts have been earning interest. Uh, at the sort of big scale business model of it, you look to the UK for a really successful example where you have the premium bond. Those bonds are all being pooled by one institution, the government. They do not earn interest. So essentially, the, the interest that isn't being earned by the individual is turned into prizes. It's a pooled set of funds that then distribute prizes out monthly to bondholders. And people are essentially making their decision for themselves that they are more that they are comfortable with the probabilistic chance of winning because that's more fun, has more prizes, is probably better winnings than the guarantee of a low interest rate. 
So you're deciding if you want a guarantee versus probabilistic. In this interest rate environment, frankly, you'd sort of be a fool to not go with probabilistic because interest rates are so terrible. Um, but you see over decades in the UK that even with interest rates changing, it still actually has cr incredibly high demand because of the thrill, most likely in the community aspect of it. Now, why, why this? Um, the impression I get is there needs to be permission from some financial in entity. I, I didn't yeah. quite so get the, that. The Why? Issue, Why can't the yeah, credit? Good question. Credit, you know, I just, have the same question. Why can't we do, do this, this thing? <laughs> it seems so reasonable, and it really isn't gambling. It is your money. But actually, in this country, we have an enormously complicated, complex web of regulations around any games of chance and then what financial institutions can do. So these are separate regulations that are interacting pretty poorly around this product. So you both have to be allowed to offer a game of chance, which is incredibly regulated and almost uniquely mon monopolized by states, like state governments. And then you have what financial institutions are actually authorized to do, which in this case, banks at all different levels are prohibited from offering games of chance. So that's, that's really the, the core issue. And one of the fascinating sort of history lessons that, that I've learned through the, sort of learning more about this is that the reason that that, that is the case is that uh, you know, the lottery uh, is the state's effort to take away uh, a money-making institution from organized crime. And if you watch sort of a, you know, any gangster movie, somebody is running the numbers. The numbers is a neighborhood lottery back in the day that used to be a, um, a, a terrific money maker for organized crime, and, and the state stepped in and said, uh, we want people to, you know, people need to have <laughs> access to this. <laughs> yeah, exactly, we'll, we'll take the money. <laughs> right. That's the skeptics' it. approach That's to it. More right. We want to tax it. <laughs> That's right. Uh, so, you know, it really is, you know, these rules are in place uh, for uh, crime prevention and, and state revenue generation. And uh, what's the, the law of unintended consequences is uh, also uh, banks can't offer this interesting savings product to people. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think the unintended consequences is exactly, we have history yeah. in this yeah. country, yeah. which sort of explains why you have certain laws that might not seem completely rational. I'd also just make the point that, that timing is everything in a lot of issues like this. And, and for the reasons already mentioned, this is a particularly good time economically mm -hmm. for this mm -hmm. because you've got both low inflation and low interest rates. Mm -hmm. So when you put money into, say, a bond or something like this for a period of years with no interest, you're neither losing much in way of interest, nor are you losing capital. If we had high inflation, then locking up a bond for several years with no interest mm -hmm. would mean that your capital would deteriorate. Um, it still may be sensible to do it, but that's what would happen. So it, 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 this is a particularly good period for this kind of way of getting people uh, to invest. And it's important not to lose that opportunity, uh, both economically and politically, to move it forward. We have uh, one more question about halfway back, uh, and then I think we'll, we'll uh, wrap it up. Hi, I'm Zara Kessler from Bloomberg. Um, I guess this is for Representative Flexer. You just said that the kind of the great thing about lotteries is you get a lot of uh, revenue for your state and oh, you, or you can, right. not necessarily a lot, but <laughs> states make states <laughs> states do make a lot of money off of those other lotteries in 7-Eleven. So kind of devil's advocate question is why offer this next to it? That's a great question and it's a tricky question for me and um, as you might have been able to tell from my early remarks, I'm not a huge fan. Um, of the lottery. I know I cannot walk into the Connecticut General Assembly and suddenly uh, eliminate it, um, but I, I, I think um, it is perhaps a conflicting message to offer these two programs side by side, but perhaps we can get more and more people putting money into these types of savings accounts and, and spending less money on the lottery, and if those revenues go down, then so be it. Yeah, but, but, but from a state's point of view, and the federal government for that matter, you, if you, look at, if you look at the bond version of this as a state or federal version, then what you're really doing is, is supplementing the traditional lottery, which is sort of money straight into the cash flow of mm -hmm. the state, mm -hmm. into, uh, you're, you're in parallel uh, creating a system which encourages long-term investment in the state. This is, this is most appropriate for a state thinking about long-term capital investments, roads, bridges, education, and so on, to have a, a pool of funds uh, through a bond system 
that you know, it's what they do anyway. This is what we have in, st uh, in finance of, of, of bonds and taxes and so on as two separate methods of financing um, uh, state uh, activities. So it's not really, uh, even though states initially, I think, might say, well, wait a minute, this is now competing, we're competing with ourselves. They're not really doing that because it's a different form of investment in the state. It's, it's addressing long-term investment as opposed to, cap to cash flow for the state. So I, I think that in, in the long run, it's, it's, it makes a lot of sense for the public finance of the state that's already thinking about lotteries or doing lotteries to diversify in this way um, um, into a bond, into a bond uh, variant of the basic lottery. No, it's the goal of the program, right? The goal of the program is to get family savings so that they can build their own economic right. security, and that's something that the, that the, the state, state very is, clearly has an interest in doing. Um, because in the long run, you can see a world where families that are more economically secure, more financially secure, even though they may be uh, relatively low income, could very well be less dependent on public assistance and other that's forms uh, uh, of uh, uh, other uses of state revenue. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Real quickly on that, I mean, it could also be, in addition from good public policy in terms of the security, the financial security of state residents, what we see in the UK is that, I think as Stuart was also saying, it's a lower cost of borrowing for them, essentially. Like they can, if they have a, as a public institution offer savings bonds as with a PLS layer that they're not paying interest on, they don't have to borrow as much money from someone else. Um, so from a purely, you know, we, whatever about the outcome of our residents' perspective, this actually just might be a good financial decision for the public entity who's trying to raise, you know, cheaper cost of funds for themselves. Um, and the other thing, just real quick, is if folks are interested in this in our paper, lottery paper out front, you know, we did do a national survey and we're trying to get at if you had a savings ticket alongside a regular lottery ticket, is this competitive with this takeaway? And you know, this isn't sort of conclusive, and we need a real-world example of this, and we hope to have one soon. But um, you know, it, these aren't the same product, and these aren't the same proposition for a lottery customer, and they're very different prizes and very different stakes. And we actually believe that they aren't, you know, that they are not mutually exclusive, and they could be side by side, and both could be successful. The same way in the UK, you actually have lottery now as well as the premium bond. When premium bond was first introduced, you didn't have lottery, now you have both, and both remain successful. So I'd, we shouldn't go into this with an either or, right? It's a question of how do you diversify what you're offering, how do you reach consumers, what's good public policy, but we believe all of it can be intertwined successfully. This is, uh, this is obviously, you know, a, a deep area. You sort of scratch and dig more into this, you find more layers to it. I think um, we're very encouraged to see the growth that's happened uh, across the different states. Thank you for your work doing that. Um, and uh, thank you to the audience for, for joining us here today and for your great questions. And, and please join me in thanking all of our panelists for a good session today.